The first time I ever met him was at a bry at somebody's house and he was talking to the dog. At the time he was the strategist, a made up title uh, at the Mail and Guardian and he was talking to this dog and he kept saying to the dog, what is your strategy? The dog of course was trying to eat biltong off the, or burevors off the bry and that's the first time I met him. I looked at him and I thought, really? What a strange guy. <laughs> Nothing that has ever happened in between has, has <laughs> disavowed me of my first intentions. Except he is extremely, extremely smart and very truthful, as you're about to discover. Thanks, Shappers. Um, so I don't normally get nervous at these things, but you guys are like the best audience I think I'm going to get. So I'm a little bit nervous. So like if I start wobbling around, just tell me. I do need my Prezo up there or something. Okay, so starting up, staying up, I'm going to be talking about what's gone down in the last 13 months at Mo Tribe. Um, and if any of you are friends with me on Facebook, probably you are, because I'm still trying to crack a thousand, but I'm like 900 and something. If any of you are not, just add me now, please. Um, like basically, I said I'm going to be controversial, and what I really mean by that is that I'm going to strip off a little bit of veneer, tell a bit of truth, uh, because like ever since I got to Joburg, everyone keeps coming up to me and saying, "Oh, Mo Tribe, I hear you guys are doing so well," and I'm like, "Who are you hearing this from? Like, why are you telling me this? Like, that's a lot of pressure." And I think that uh, some <laughs> some people really think that. Um, it's like a bed of roses, right? So hopefully I'll dispel that myth today um, by going to the next slide. Or not. No, I will just kick it old school, right? So we're a 15-month old startup, and we're based in Cape Town. <laughs> um, we're a platform for building and empowering mobile tribes. And mobile tribes are brand fanatics, families, groups, circles, whatever you want to call a bunch of people that are really tightly knit. And what makes us special is that we're optimized for the mobile web, and it works great in the emerging markets, and it creates deep and rich engagement. Um, but to tell the story, um, I've got to get rid of all the vanity metrics. And you'll see the vanity metrics as we go along. And the reason I'm telling them to you is probably going to be because we no longer think they're relevant. Uh, and the story started in a place that looks like this, um, in the corridors of Vodacom. This actually isn't the corridors of Vodacom. Vodacom is a little bit more organic looking inside. Um, and the dividers are blue, not gray. <laughs> <laughs> so. Somewhere down in that morass on the left uh, were Nick and I, and we were hustling, but in the context of a corporate. And, um, you know, the problem with corporate is that, firstly, everyone's operating on the basis that there's safety in numbers, right? So it's a giant, like, cover your own ass exercise of, like, forwarding email in order to avoid actually doing work. Uh, and every now and then, someone punches a hole through that and actually does some innovation. And it's normally when they get to go and work outside of the building for a couple of weeks and have ideas. Um, and the other thing about it is that you can be very successful there, but that success is more socio-political than innovative. So if you're what uh, Rian refers to as a maker, like me, it's not very rewarding um, because you don't really have a growth path. Um, the growth path is that you become management, and geeks don't want to be management. Geeks want to just get paid more to be awesome, right? <laughs> and make awesome products. I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. So <clears throat> just the timeline, OK? In November 2009, there was the cat catastrophic event. And that event was that Nick and I are here over the phone that we've been restructured for the fifth time in 12 months. Well. 18 months. And at that point, we're like, this, this is not going to work. Um, so we start thinking, well, we've always wanted to do startup. Nick, uh, I think Nick's more entrepreneurial than I am. Like, I'm sort of middle-aged, got a family and a kid. You know what I mean? Like, I was starting to feel kind of cozy inside those corridors at Vodacom. And like, to Nick's credit, he like, basically kicked me in the balls and said, let's do this, because you know, we're not going to have another shot. So what we figured is that uh, you know, we'd start 
batting around some ideas. And during that December break, my wife said to me uh, that she was going to get a job. I was like, are you crazy? Why would you get a job? Like, why don't we build a social network and monetize it over the holidays? Um, and so she sort of said, OK, let's try that. You know, <laughs> sounds, sounds better than working a temp job or something. So like, I whipped up this little thing, basically like an MVP for a social network, and we put it live, targeted at emo kids in the United States. Um, and with a budget of like, you know, we're sort of like, well, they spend 100 rand a day on Google Ads and see if we can get some emo kids in this thing and see what they do. And they came. Um, and like four months later, the site was doing 2 million page impressions a month. Um, we weren't making a lot of money on advertising, right? But that wasn't really the point um, at that stage. So when we got back from vacation, um, Nick and I sat down and we sort of joined the dots, which is like this community thing that's going on. We actually need a lot of those. And because we come from a media background, um, we were thinking like, let's get a thousand sites doing 10 million impressions a month. That's like how we're going to roll. Then obviously, um, we started thinking, how are we going to get 10,000 sites? Damn, we need a platform, right? Because no one's going to build that stuff uh, one by one. So in January, we sort of joined all these dots and we started the VC hunt. Um, by April, we had a term sheet. And August, we relocated to Cape Town and we got the money. So that's more or less how long it took. Um, and then we launched on the 13th of September. So like, there's an emotional graph, right? Where like, we're pretty happy at Vodacom and we just got completely punked by this reorg. And as we figured it out, we got more and more happy and excited and the VC hunt started really well. But then there was this like three month period before we got the term sheet where you just sort of like not knowing and the uncertainty about whether you've done the right thing or not, like starts to eat away at, at your sort of self confidence. And when we got the term sheet, we're like, yeah, we stoked. Then we realized now we've actually got to do it. <laughs> That was, that was a, like probably one of the scarier moments. And then obviously when we got the cash and we started doing it, then, then we were up. And since then it's been pretty much like upward, I guess. More, more sort of flatter up than directly like up, but it's been pretty good. But the thing is that during all of this time, like there were many, many times when we thought, A, it's not going to happen. B, what have we done? Like, I, my birthday present to myself on the 28th of January, before we had commitment from the VC, was to resign from Vodacom. That was what I gave myself on my birthday. And I was really stoked with my present. <laughs> Anyways, so <clears throat> the hunt for VC. Uh, we're in part two now, but part one started on Facebook. So this is the original. This is what happened. I sent Justin Stanford a message on Facebook, and I'm like, hey, we want to do something like, and he's like, OK, let's meet. So we went and met him on his roof, um, which is kind of cool in Cape Town. And he spent about three or four hours telling us a whole bunch of stuff about you know, what needs to go into the business plan and so on. This is actually the original, so there it is. Um, and what he said to us was, the boxes we seemed to tick at that early point was firstly that we have domain expertise. Uh, and what that means is that he knew who we were. We were sort of recognized for what we do in our industry. So it's not like complete random people coming out of the woodwork with, with fairly crazy ideas. The timing was right in terms of where they were with the fund um, and mobile in general. I think for the last 18 months, everyone's felt like this is the time for mobile. Um, and we had the beginnings of a business model that can scale. Now, the word scale is a scary one. Um, and I, like the question that we've always been asking ourselves again and again is what does it mean when you talk scalable and business, right? So on the one hand, it's, it's a growth engine that is eventually going to sustain itself, OK? Um, and that's tricky, because if you've got this constantly rising cost as you're scaling the business, um, it makes it a little bit less attractive. Uh, you need revenue that can grow independently of those costs. And you need some sort of international growth potential from a South African point of view. So like consulting and selling time isn't quite going to cut it from a, a VC raise because what you can't scale is your own time and yourself as an individual. 
So what you need is to sort of completely have an arbitrary relationship between your sales and your, your production from a cost point of view. This is at least what I've gleaned, and like, to be honest, I don't really know like, anything about this. I'm, like, I'm the CTO, right? I'm not the business guy. Um, but a lot of it comes down to execution. So it's not so much like <clears throat> what you're doing, but how you do it. We knew at that point that anybody could launch a social networking platform for mobile pretty much at the same time as us. And I've seen it happen many times in an industry where, you know, like one product will launch that looks like X, and then suddenly there's three of them. And it was impossible that they were all copying each other because they launched like within a two-week window. So like everyone had the same idea at the same time and started at the same time and, and launched at the same time. So what we knew is that a lot of this had to do with how we were going to build this product ourselves. Um, and the problem was that we had this dragon with four heads. We needed a website, a mobile site, the dashboard thing that the users are going to use to manage their sites, and of course the tribes themselves. So it's like a hell of a lot of work to get done. And uh, Nick and I were really keen on just like getting this thing done as soon as humanly possible. Um, and some of the other challenges obviously are that there are many devices and territories and user stories around what they're going to do on these different tribes. So how do you make something that's going to work in Africa, in India, in New York, and, and be relatively consistent? And so this is a picture of all the phones we don't support. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Um, right. So we gave ourselves a 40-day like, go-to-market period, right? So like, I'm the coder. Nick, uh, basically just my support team um, and helping me with the strategy and getting it right. Uh, and we work really well together. And I think I'll talk a bit about co-founders and gelling and all that sort of stuff. But basically, Nick, he's like a human wrecking ball on technology, right? He's the exact opposite use case of anything that we ever want to do. So I'll, I'll give him something that I'm 100% convinced will not break, and boom. He hasn't even loaded it, and it isn't working, right? He just has this knack. It's amazing. Um, so we did all of this stuff. Um, we built a website with basically an MVP for transactions. We did a lot of, uh, we spent a lot of time integrating with PayPal and sort of beating our heads up about, like, what, is the, what are the sort of charging points going to be, and how do we actually bill uh, on a subscription basis and all that sort of stuff. Um, we built the mobile portal for discovery, which is really basic. The dashboard, CMS, and analytics were pretty, pretty advanced. Um, and then the sites with the plugins and the blogins, all, blogging and all that sort of stuff, um, we got it all done in 40 days. Um, so the stack looks like this. And this is where the geek part comes in, I guess, is we're using LAMP. Um, and the interesting different part at this point was that we're using Cassandra. So those of you in the big data thing yesterday will know Cassandra is basically like a distributed key value store that can you know, take a nuke and still keep working, basically. Um, so at the time, there were a couple of things um, which I guess we were doing. One of them was trying to figure out Cassandra because it wasn't really easy, um, and setting up the entire infrastructure. So we decided early that we're going to use Amazon Web Services. And the key thing was that uh, Amazon launched the Elastic Block Store a little bit prior to, like sort of in that six month period between starting to evaluate what tech we're going to use when we actually uh, do the build um, and actually doing the build, they launched EBS. And the key thing about EBS was that it's, it's a persistent storage drive on the EC2 instances. So before that, you had to build this like redundancy where, you know, if you really want to feel safe about it, you've got to be backing up onto S3 all the time and having a lot of redundancy so that if two or three of your instances go out, um, you know, then you're going to survive. So they brought in EBS. So at that point, we're like, OK, this is good. Um, we're going to use it. So we set up a load balancer. We used HAProxy for that, two web app servers, uh, MySQL server. We used Amazon RDS for that, which is basically like an outsourced MySQL configuration and management system. Memcache. We set up two Cassandra nodes and an SMTP server and something to do device profiling. So the key thing um, with device profiling 
is that you've got to match the user agent string of the browser to some metadata about the phone, right? So it's like, how wide is the screen of the phone? Is it a smartphone? Is it touch or keypad? All that sort of stuff. Um, and there are a lot of different ways to do that. So what we did is we just built this like unified system that we can just uh, you know, throw a user agent string at it, get back the data that we need, and carry on working without like, basically integrating that with sort of a loosely coupled system. So we set all of that up. cost us nine grand a month, basically, at the end of that, to have all of that stuff running. And I don't know, it's like 10 servers or something. Um, and we set it up in a day, right? So at that point, we were all thinking, wow, this cloud thing is brilliant. We're still thinking that, by the way. But at that point, the thing that struck us was procuring hardware, getting it into a data center, and doing all of that stuff just wasn't going to be possible in a 24-hour period, unless you're like, actually physically there and you've done it a bazillion times before. Um, so so the, the Amazon Web Services component of it, I think, was really critical to time to market. And I worked on two guiding principles, right? So two hours or kill is if it takes me longer than two hours to do something, it's bullshit and I'm not interested. OK, boom, out of the MVP. Because keep in mind that at that point, we're racing against time. And we just scrapped a whole bunch of stuff because it's, it was going to take too long. So th I guess the, the way that I'm cheating here is that we broke stuff up into pretty small components. So if we, it was taking two hours, it was because we were being idiots. Um, and Cassandra was like, a, you know, an hour and 59 minutes. It was like really borderline. And the other was that we're going to do a NoSQL approach to basically denormalize data. So the goal was to not have any joins in this whole thing, even though we were using MySQL. Um, and we failed at that because we ended up with two joins. And those two joins haunt us to this day in our system. Um, so where was it built? Under duvets, in restaurants, on the couch. Uh, Nick and I not both under the duvet at the same time. <laughs> At the 40i offices, uh, everywhere. Literally, I had a laptop, and I would code when I wasn't actually sleeping. Um, and what was great is that my wife really wanted to move to Cape Town, so she was just in a really good mood for those 40 days anyway. And that's like really the only way that I got through it. So we went live. Um, and things start to go crazy, right? Like we signed these two big brands like just before we launch. So like literally a week before we go live, without even a product, we get a client, which is unbelievable. Um, and then a little while later, we get another one, which is massive. And within the first three months, we like grew to 300,000 users on this platform. And crazy bad things start happening too. Like Cassandra just isn't alive one morning when I wake up, right? And it's not really telling me why. And I know that I really struggled with the, the setup. Like I'm not a proper geek. Like I might just confess I'm a journalist designer. Right? So it's a bit of a misnomer. Um, so I'm sitting there thinking, Cassandra, well, like your time's over, you know? Um, and Nick has this thing that he says, right? Which is that we're at the cutting edge of incompetence, OK? Because basically, we're learning like stuff that other people haven't started learning yet. So by the time you get there, we'll probably have done it. And look, there are a lot of guys in this room who have probably done much more than this anyway. But the point is that within our own time scale, we like, we basically, incompetence is great because tomorrow we will have figured it out and it was something that we didn't know. And that's really the only way that we measure ourselves these days is just like, if you're going to break it, just make sure you fix it really fast. Um, so there's, there's a bit of cowboy in our, our dev mentality, I guess. Um, and I like this picture because of the sheer enormity of what's taking place there. <laughs> Hey, how on earth does that happen? <laughs> anyway, so Cassandra, boom, right? We just, we chucked it. So we've, we switched to MongoDB. Um, and MongoDB is interesting because it's got this like pretty complicated sounding setup. Like basically you need a router, which is what the app servers talk to. Then there's like three config servers that do random stuff around knowing what other servers need to talk to each other. And then there's shards, which is where the data gets stored, and the shards get into replica sets. So you make a whole replica set into a shard. So in theory, you should have three, uh, three machines in, a, in each replica set, and then you shard that way. And MongoDB does sharding really well. Um, 
and we love it. The cool thing is that you get all the benefits of NoSQL, um, and by that for me really, it's about uh, basically separating your read and write time from the scale and size of your data, right? So it doesn't matter whether you've got a terabyte or a megabyte of data in that thing, you're still always gonna get your reads and writes out in a couple of milliseconds, which is great, because the problem that I've traditionally always had, and I'm not the best as you know, a SQL designer, is that as tables get bigger and you need to do bigger row scans, you end up, like, things slow down incrementally over time. So this thing was like, uh, the bomb for us. And it supports MapReduce, not MapperReduce. It was a bit late when I did this. And this is a typical query that you would run on Mongo, right? So you can, there's a DB, there's a collection called users, you run a function called find, uh, where the first name is Jezebel, and you can sort it uh, by the last name descending, right? It's a typical sort of query that you want to do. So the great thing is that with Cassandra, it's like, if you forget the key that you use to put that data in, it's dead to you. You're never going to find it again, right? It's like, uh, like there's a word for it, I think. Like it's basically been orphaned, okay? Whereas with Mongo, you can still actually say, just show me what's in this collection. Like I want to see a list of these things. Um, you should never forget a key, by the way. But in the back of your mind, you know, you always worry about that sort of thing. Um, so more scaling fun that we had was that at some point, and generally the problems happen when I'm away on a weekend or like some really inconvenient time, like my wedding anniversary or whatever, shit just goes bang, right? And um, so we had some issues with the MySQL DB. So what we did there was um, the, the Amazon solution is great because you basically say, right, this master is going to be where I do all my writes to, and then you can just spin up a whole bunch of read replicas that you connect to to do selects from, right? So you reduce the amount of write, the, the writing, uh, and concentrate it on, on the master, and then basically all the, the things that you're doing more often, like the selects, are coming out of the read replicas, and that's worked great for us. And then caching, obviously. So memcache is like, has been our savior on many different occasions, because it's like, if something gets slow, uh, there's a good chance that memcaching it is going to buy you another six months while you figure out how to make it faster again. It's sort of like a, a neat little temporary solution a lot of the time for just getting around like those, those spikes. Um, so people say to me all the time, well, what does this thing of yours do? It sounds really weird. Basically what it does is it replaces your static Moby site with a social one. Right, so this is what, you know, when we go to speak to brands and stuff like that, that's what we're saying. It's like, you've got a static Moby site, forget it, um, but your engagement's really low, you need social to fix that, so this is a solution, right? So this is what it looks like on the phone, and it, it looks like this on, the, on a basic Nokia, but also on an iPhone, right? So we've figured out how to make it look, I guess, as good as it's gonna be as a lowest common denominator HTML. So this is AHP that use it to do things like um, basically, they bring foreign doctors into the country to work with p clinics in rural areas. So they use it to get their doctors all communicating and, and doing stuff. So they can share photos, they can blog, um, and that sort of thing. And this, this network is rolled out in 20 minutes. Okay? So obviously, being platform, it means that everything's pre-built, and you can do it really quickly. Uh, so, and we've got all sorts of other cool things, like, I guess, like social like gamification stuff, like a point system that ranks the users and all that sort of stuff. It just makes it a little bit more sticky. Um, but so like I'll, I'll, I'll say to my mother, <clears throat> and my mother just went, got back online uh, after about eight years of retirement. She finally got a computer again. And she phones me and she says, you know what? Google has really got cucked since I last used it. <laughs> And I'm like, what are you talking about? And she's like, well, what is all this other shit, like image search and like, you know, video? I don't need that. I just want to find the information. So I get this like blank stare from people when I tell them what I do if they're not like directly in my industry, you know? And the question normally is why mobile? Like, why are you so obsessed about mobile? Because my Nokia is not so hot on the internet and I don't see anybody else using it. So what are you talking about actually? Um, and the obvious things are, well, it's a growth area, and it's, got, it's like a spot where innovation's happening, so that's what's appealing. Um, and there's a, a good opportunity to monetize. 
But uh, there's deeper levels to this as well. Like Nick and I both come from a media background, right? So Nick went to Rhodes because he wanted to be an embedded reporter in Iraq. I had the same thing, but about Bosnia, so you can spot the age difference there. Um, and the, the thing of it is that, like in general, like what we're interested in is things that involve social change, like on a deeper, like social fabric level. Um, and a lot of it has to do with, with memory, right? And what the relevance is, for instance, of media is that governments and, I guess, monarchies don't fear books because of their contents. They fear books because they're mobile. They're fundamentally mobile. So when information and your cultural history gets sort of embedded into the, the physical society, it's very difficult to get rid of it. And mobile does something very similar to that as well. Um, so by April, we had a million users. So we had this party called the Fuck Year Party, um, and we had a big screen with a number and the whole deal. Um, and around about this time, we started talking about the co-founder relationships. Uh, and it was also the time when we went to South by Southwest and got really drunk for two weeks, living in the same hotel room, and shit comes out, you know? You're like, hey, maybe I don't see eye to eye with you on some, some issues. So we started, but generally we worked really well together, so we're trying to figure out why. And it's because we had, like, one rule, basically, which is that reason wins in an argument, and you've got to do what's best for the company, right? So when you really disagree, then we both step back and we go, okay, well, let's bring a rational argument to the table instead of talking shit about each other um, <laughs> and sort this problem out. And it works pretty well. And then, like, I was thinking about co-founders and I'm like, two is definitely better than one or three, right? The problem with three is that you default to a voting position because it's like, I'll just go make an alliance with the other guy and boom, the merit of the idea stops being relevant. And the problem with three is that when you exit, you've got to split the money between more people. Um, and one just sucks because basically you've got no validation and you've got no one to sort of say, hey, it's going to be all right, we're going to get through this. So you start second guessing yourself. Um, and like something very important that we learned, just do shareholder agreements when you start a business. Like so many people that we know have businesses without shareholder agreements. And we're like, what on earth are you thinking, right? And it's only a problem when stuff goes pear-shaped, and that does inevitably happen. A shareholder agreement keeps you on the straights and narrow. So people keep telling us that, you know, starting a business is like a marriage. Uh, so, you know, the bottom line, that the way I see it is that the CTO has a maternal and organic relationship, or the technical co-founder, with the product. Like, it's living inside you, and then gradually you're getting it out and then you give birth, right? And then there's that period afterwards where everyone's looking at you like, what the hell have you done? Um, and the father, or the sort of paternal, and I'm using stereotypes, like apologies for that, but the, the CEO has a paternal role. And you feel sort of naturally distanced from the process in the beginning because you're not like at the coal face of doing it. But as time, you start to play more of a mentorship and guidance role. Um, and to an extent, like, it has to be like this because that's just probably the best and most efficient way to get this thing done. Um, so, and yeah, I don't, I don't look cuter the harder I work. So. so we have this debate, and this is one of the big chasms, was media versus platform, right? Do we have 10,000 sites doing a million impressions a month, or do we go... It's not our responsibility. Let the users build these things and let's give up control of the creation of sites. And we hovered on this for an entire year. And it caused, I wouldn't say bad decisions, but some decisions that maybe weren't optimal for the business. Like we just couldn't quite let go of the media side of things. So the, the media thing makes money through advertising and membership subscriptions and content sales, right? And that's a pretty standard media play. But the platform is about publisher subscriptions and revenue share on even smaller margins. So you've got to have a huge amount of faith in the fact that there's going to be an uptake of your product. And it took us a long time. Uh, and we only really got to this point three months ago, where we just, or two, two months ago, where we decided, you know what, forget about media, we're going platform. And because we had this sort of dual thing, there's been a lot of fringe benefits of the work that we did in the first year on our new emphasis on platform. 
Um, but the danger is that you land in this like service tar pit, which is like, let's make money, right? Let's do services for clients and get some revenue. Like who turns away revenue, right? The problem is that then you're working on client work instead of following the roadmap and you don't end up with the scalable business that you wanted in the beginning because now you're actually just selling time again. Um, and there's this catch-22 about money, right? Should you take whatever money comes your way or should you stick to the plan? Or to put it another way, will you even have a business if you start turning away revenue? Like what kind of business practice is it to turn away money? Surely the practice of business is to get money. Um, and then the alternatives start coming into your head like, well, if we had more funding, then we wouldn't have to worry about revenue, and then we could do the plan, right? And then everything would just be awesome. Um, and we don't really know what the solution is. I think it's different for everyone. But problems are meant to be solved, right? And we have inspiration everywhere. Like these are, these are some of our users. These are the juggalos, right? I love the juggalos, face painted like clowns, okay? Midwest, Michigan, crazy dudes. And I'll tell you what like, really freaked me out the one day, is I found out that the juggalos have been going onto 4chan and threatening hackers on 4chan and saying, come to our website, we will destroy you. On 4chan, right? <laughs> it's like, where do Anonymous hang out? Those are the guys that trashed Sony. Little Mo tribe in Africa with a bit of AWS, never gonna withstand that. Boom, like 600 guys came in and just caused chaos for like eight hours. And we we're like, you juggalos. <laughs> anyway, and then we had Guinness, right? And they came to us and said, we've got this target. We want 750,000 Nigerians on the site in six months. We're like, okay, no problem, right? What do you bring? Okay, TV, all this other kind of cool stuff. Um, and we ran the media for this. We worked with Precult, and this is a great project. Um, they really knew what they were doing. And we built this thing, right? And it looked awesome. It was about soccer. And we got to 520,000 in that period. So it wasn't too bad, right? We were happy with it. Half a million people. Come on, who has a campaign that gets half a million people? Okay, there are some. Um, but the most moving thing about it was that Guinness were like so into it that they just brought the entire Argentinian football team to Nigeria to play the first FIFA regulated match in Nigeria. It was unbelievable. And they used the site to pick who would sing the national anthem, uh, well, co sing, who would be on the radio commentary panel, um, you know, who would be on the TV studio. It was amazing. Like, they found VIPs in that community, and it was the perfect execution of a campaign. Like, I've never seen anything like it. So that was really, really inspiring. And we had these like crazy metrics, like 23 average pages for bit per visit. And when you take off the, the sort of bounces, then you get 60 plus for the returning users. That's like a pretty decent uh, engagement statistic for, for any kind of platform, never mind whether it's web or mobile. We're tribes with like 1,000 active users generating 2 million pages a month. So that was really, really inspiring. And people often come to us and they're like, yeah, but what about Facebook? Like, I don't want to be on two social networks, right? Like, why would, you know, I'm already on Twitter. That's bad enough, a bunch of people talking shit about me on the internet. And, and now you want me to join another social network. When Facebook grows, we grow. Um, about a month ago, we just turned off all of our advertising. We're like, we're over it. It must grow organically now. It's like sink or swim for this platform. And Facebook generates more than half of our organic growth every day. So we love Facebook. And people who use Facebook understand that if you're going to go from Facebook into something that is fundamentally underground, like Motribe, it's because you're expressing a different kind of unofficial identity. And you're experimenting with that. And that's why teens, it really works for teens. And as you get around the sort of older, it stops being about identity and experimentation, more about affiliation to groups and sports and that sort of thing. So we got to October, 1.7 million users. That's a vanity metric, but you know, I just gotta say it's 6,000 tries for so long. So, and we just launched a, a new portal that allows you to do all the stuff that you used to do on desktop, but now you can do it on your phone as well. So you can literally take a feature phone and launch a social network in about 10 minutes. Like you get metrics, we help you invite people, we, uh, you know, we'll give you a logo builder tool so that you can build a logo because you don't have a PC and you're not a designer. 
Um, so it's, it's kind of neat. Um, and I must just say that after a year of learning, we now know what we need to do. Like we're not beating ourselves up, like maybe we made some wrong decisions along the way. But the point is that we now have a business that we want to be in and that we believe is going to grow really well. And we're going to do our best to try and inspire younger startups and help them to, I guess, just sort of sidestep some of the hurdles that we had. Um, so thank you very much. That brings me to the end of that. Um, yeah, questions. I've actually got to two minutes, I think, before 12. So I don't know how Q&A. Considering I've been uh, chastised to make everything run faster, well done. I told you he's really smart and punctual. You guys look shattered, by the way. <laughs> but I talk too long. It's a monotonous voice, I know. I did say smart. I didn't say it was interesting. Um, are there any questions? <laughs> they don't Fail. think you're very interesting um. either. Um, Next up is a very interesting session called Lunch. Um, I'm supposed to intro lunch, but I don't know what's on the menu apart from nibbly handheld things. Gareth Osher. Yeah. Just to, can you walk through the funding side of, of MoTribe? And 40i, and obviously 40i went through a bit of up and down themselves and stuff recently. Yeah. Just how that's impacted during the psyche, what you're doing the next round, that kind of stuff? Um, I wouldn't say that it's impacted us much. I mean, we've obviously been on the sidelines a bit of seeing, um, you know, what happened with Fire ID and that sort of thing. Um, but in general, 40i have been pretty good at, like, segmenting. So it, it's like, you know, they don't really talk much about the other investees. And so there hasn't been much impact on us. I think that, like, we're now at the point where we, we're basically raising a bridge round because we need another six or seven months to just prove more of the models around the platform and the monetization stuff. Uh, Nick's been on a roadshow to the US like a madman. And, you know, being in South Africa is actually a problem for us, like, because the investors are saying, well, you know, $5 million, that's not really enough. Like, what we've got to put in is $20 million before it becomes worth it for us to figure out how South Africa works and to get enough of a return. But on the other hand, um, there's been huge amounts of positive feedback around that. So, you know, I, I think to, to a large extent, we wouldn't have done it if we didn't get funding. So that's number one. Um, it's not the kind of thing that you can really bootstrap because it was a bit capital intensive in the beginning and we didn't want to fund it by selling services. Um, but where we're at now, um, I don't know. It's kind of like we'll, we'll see what happens over the next couple of months and, you know, hope for the best. I think what the main thing that we're seeing is that there's enough startup momentum building that we're seeing people who work at startups potentially uh, losing their jobs and finding other startups to go to. So there's that confidence from a developer point of view that there's a safety net, that you don't have to go work at a big corporate in order to, um, I guess, maintain your living. And for some reason, developers think they're going to be out of a job, right? And everyone's saying we need developers. It's ridiculous. Like, I think developers also need to reassess their understanding of their role in the world right now and just sort of get with the program, you know, instead of being paranoid. Okay. Well, there you have it. Straight from Vincent's mouth. <laughs> yeah, another question. Okay, so the question is, how have the funders influenced the product evolution? Um, I would say that probably 0% um, influence. Uh, but there's always Thank a you, bit Vincent. of... <laughs> Who wants to go for lunch? <laughs> Are you guys hungry or do you want to talk more shit? Okay, can I sit down? Or you all just go for okay, lunch. Okay, so not much finished? influence, right. right? I don't have to stand up here anymore with him. He's wore a red T-shirt as well. But the kind of thing they'll say is, well, <clears throat> there's a lot of revenue in this particular deal. It looks pretty good, right? So just like hint. Um, and, and those hints are not always like 100% aligned with what we want. Like they want to protect their investment and have as little risk as possible. 
And we want as much risk as possible because at the end of the day, we're working for a high value of equity and not a business that's making like, you know, sustainable revenue, but on a small scale. Like we're not a small to medium enterprise, like we're a startup, which means we've got 12 months to prove that if you open the tap after that period, this thing's going to like basically jump past small to medium and get really big. Like that's what we're trying to do. But, you know, when money's on the table, then it gets difficult and complicated. It's a question. Well, we don't have an exit in sight, but we didn't decide to do this thing so that we could run a family business. So it's like five to six years, probably, and there has to be an exit or an acquisition. And like an exit doesn't have to be an exit, right? It can just be doing really well and getting some more investors. I don't know. I mean, it's so far in the future, like people ask us for like five year revenue projections and we just sort of like, dudes. <laughs> What, what industry are we in, right? So we make up some numbers and it's a hockey stick and it looks awesome. We don't know. Cool, thank you very much. Now I think you all need to have some lunch. <laughs>